Welcome back to Trials and Tribulations. Uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about marketing and how it relates both to small business and to law firms. Because I'm sure as a lot of you folks know, maybe when you people first started practicing, if you were practicing in the early 2000s to 2010, law firm advertising wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't something that people were doing on the regular basis. There were the volume practices that were advertising on billboards and on television late at night. But that has shifted dramatically. Yeah, if anything, it was taboo. Right. And yeah, I mean, when I was practicing back in, what, 2005 to 2015, doing personal injury work, I would never even thought twice about putting my face on a billboard, a bus station, on the internet. But now, if you don't do that, it's it's almost like you can't get business. Well, we've learned what, what worked yesterday isn't going to work in a week. Right. I know I'm being a little bit extreme about that, but we've learned in in our business career that marketing methodologies that worked for us a few years ago don't work anymore. So you have to constantly being you have to constantly be evolving. In the legal space though, it's been a dramatic shift. It's been a sea change. Well, yeah, because back I think even as early as the middle part of, of our legal career, which is not like it's that long mm-hmm. ago, but back then everything was referral based. So most of the cases that I got came from friends, former clients, other lawyers, just Anybody who knew what I did would think about me for certain areas of practice. But nowadays, I feel like people who are looking for a lawyer, they go to the internet first. That's the first place they go. People who are looking for anything. Right. That's the first place they go now. They don't necessarily make a phone call or say, oh, yeah, my buddy from high school is a lawyer. Let me call him and see who he knows. That's not the way people behave anymore. Right. And so it's become less about the, I guess, who you know for a referral base as a trial lawyer and more about how strong your marketing department is. But I, you know, in doing a little- Assuming you have a marketing department. That's what I was gonna say. I was doing a little bit of of research before we started talking about this today. And one of the things that I I noticed was that even with a dramatic uptick in lawyer spending and advertising, both on the internet, television, and all different arenas, there are still many lawyers who A, don't respond immediately to folks who are looking for them online. It takes three days in some of the statistics that I read to respond to people. They still aren't using it to the extent that it should be used. Yeah. But even with all that being true, if I were to step back in and go full-time back to being a trial lawyer, the very first thing I would do, it wouldn't be to call my old referral sources or call my old clients. It would be to establish a marketing department and a marketing budget because I'd have to figure out what's going to be my cost per acquisition. How many cases can I get in different channels? Stuff that I never would have thought about. Before. I think that's the only way to run a practice these days. And you and I traveling around the country for years now, speaking with lawyers from all over the country, uh, there's one common theme is that once these big advertising firms come into your territory, you either adapt or you're going to get left behind. It's true. And, you know, the larger and, you know, we don't have to say them by name, but the largest of the personal injury advertising law firms, they've developed almost like a vertical integration. They're not Mm -hmm. they're no longer a law firm. They're like a full scale, vertically integrated business where they have all the marketing in house. They have all the referral sources. They're even capturing the client relation, relationship management software. Yeah, everything. You know, so if if you don't have access to that type of technology, it's almost as if you're going to get left out in the cold. Not almost. It's a certainty yeah. at this point. I, I remember you and I, we went to one of these major national firms, and we went to the best word I could say, the best phrase would be their nerve center. And we didn't know what to expect. And I think once we saw that operation, we were changed forever. Yeah. That really showed how far some of these firms have gone and how they're light years ahead, and they're leaving a lot of their competition in the dust. And you're seeing that... There's a whole collateral effect to that is that legal marketing's basically become a whole new industry. And you have a lot of lawyers all over the country who are essentially scrambling to keep up and to catch up and to even go from having zero marketing to having something because they recognize that if they don't, they're going to be in in big trouble. And it's like for a lawyer, you know, when you're talking about a, a product that you're selling on the internet or any other type of service, I feel like there are good metrics that you can find to tell what your typical expected cost per acquisition could be, you know, whether you're gonna get a certain amount of clicks with certain advertising types and whatnot. But I think it's still a little bit uncertain for lawyers what they can expect when they go into hiring an outside marketing agency. I know that I made some attempts to do this, like maybe around 2014, 2015, I hired an agency to help me figure out what I can get from Google AdWords and things of that nature. 
I don't know if it wasn't a great agency or whatever the case may be, or I wasn't spending enough money, but the return simply wasn't there despite all the promises. So it's very easy for someone who doesn't understand this arena to quickly get gobbled up and lose a ton of money. Well, I think that that's, that's always the risk. And I think that's what keeps a lot of attorneys from throwing their hat in the ring in the first place. Or once they do it, they have a really bad experience and say, you know what, I'm just, this is just a black hole of money and I'm losing too much. But I think the challenge is, like you're saying, what's the strategy? Who are you going after? Are you going after, are you trying to brand yourself as having a certain expertise? Are you trying to get involved in a multi-district litigation or a mass tort as it's otherwise known? And that's a whole different technique. Yeah. There's a lot of different, you know, so it comes down to the fundamentals, branding, what's your target audience? What exactly are you trying to do? And, and any lawyer who's going to begin marketing and advertising needs to ask him or herself that question first, because it all backs into that. But then, you know, so then it, I come back to maybe it was sort of my old school thought of when I was practicing and I wasn't advertising and everything was by word of mouth. People who would come to me for whether it was a medical malpractice or an auto or a trucking accident, they came to me because they had some level of confidence that if they brought the case to me that I would be able to handle it and give the client the right personal attention, the right uh, um, uh, representation, and I, would, I knew what I was doing. Today with so many different advertisements, so many different spots on the internet and on television, the consumer who's looking for that right lawyer could very easily be sold a bill of goods that is totally wrong. They end up with a lawyer that does a terrible job. And then the lawyer who might have done the right job, who isn't out there advertising and pushing marketing, may not get the opportunity because of the way that this whole world has shifted. Sure, that could be a, a weird effect where you have the attorney who's the superior practitioner the superior technician, but they're not even going to get that opportunity anymore because they're not actively promoting themselves in more sophisticated ways. And so what's the solution there? I mean, do you think, I, I know Florida's tougher on advertising than some other states. I, I don't actually know if, if they've been policing the internet in the same way that they yeah, would have police billboards, but do you think that there needs to be some limitations on what can be marketed as a trial lawyer, as a personal injury lawyer in particular, on the internet or on television or on billboards? I think there should be some regulation and ethical rules around it. And I'll kind of make an analogy here that I think is it's fitting. And it's it's ties into what we've just been discussing, where you have drug companies that rep that market, you know, certain medications direct to consumer. And that was a, a revolutionary thing. Before that, if something was the matter, you'd go to your doctor and your doctor would know which medications to prescribe you. Now and this is a you know, pretty recent phenomenon, relatively, where the drug makers go directly to the consumer and say, hey, are you feeling like this? Are you feeling like that? Here's the drug for you. Well, like television advertisement of for course. drugs. Of course. And, I... and it, so it switched the dynamic where you had the patient going to the doctor asking for a particular medication rather than the doctor telling them which medication they needed. Right. And I think it's a similar phenomenon to what you're discussing right now where perhaps the superior technician and, and this hypothetical lawyer who will get the better result for the client, who's more competent, who's more trustworthy, they might not even get the shot anymore because the the, the consumer, which is the client, is going directly um, to a particular attorney who might be more savvy at marketing. So it has created a bit of a, a different dynamic. And of course, with every change, there can be new risks or new problems that are created. Well, and that's so that what you're saying leads to another issue. So you're talking about the analogy of the drug companies mm -hmm. directly advertising to consumers in the same way that lawyers are doing it. And I, I, I think that it's a good analogy because in both instances, the chances that something could go wrong are, are fairly significant. You know, you have the wrong medication that somebody's asking from their doctor because of some advertisement they've mm -hmm. seen on television. Likewise, somebody can choose the wrong lawyer because of some misleading advertisement that they've seen on TV or Potentially. on the internet, right? Likewise, though, when it comes to lawyer advertising, one thing that I've been reading, and I think you read the same, was especially in the mass tort area, lawyers are advertising on television all the time, not about the way that drugs can help people, but the way that drugs can hurt people, you know, or the way that certain products can harm people. 
And as a result of that, some of the, 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 the things I've been reading say that that may actually deter people from getting life-saving treatment or from doing something that would otherwise be good for them because lawyers are telling them how terrible those products are because it's part of some mass tort. So again, it leads, it leads me to wonder whether this has gotten way too out of control and there needs to be some type of regulation to stop marketing and advertising from dominating the decisions for a client and a lawyer. Yeah, those are, those are different, different, um, different phenomena, I think, where you have, um, you have a client, a potential client, or just a person who's watching TV who might be taking one medication they see a, an advertisement that says that this medication is dangerous and they get confused and they discontinue it perhaps. Um, I think that that's pushing it a little bit to the extreme if you say, well, this is evil stuff and you're going to cause chaos. I think that um, if anything, it's been – when we're talking specifically about mass torts, it's, it's remarkable. I remember you and I were talking about the subject a while ago and we did some research and I think something like 60 to 65 percent of all cases – in the federal court system are part of an MDL, multi-district multi litigation, which I, I'm going off the top of my head, but I think it was something like that. And that was astonishing to me. Um, but it really, it seems efficient if you have one particular product or, 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 or tort or something that affects people all across the country, it does seem like a good idea to administer that in one place. It's much more efficient than having tens of thousands of lawsuits, of course, all across the country. Uh, can it get out of control? Anything can get out of control. And I think that there are some people who are criticizing it, saying that you're, active, you know, you're actively looking for people who have been hurt, and you're encouraging them to go out and, and avail themselves of the justice system where otherwise they wouldn't. But what's wrong with that? Well, Isn't well, that why it's there in the first place is if someone's been injured, someone's been aggrieved through an action or through a product or whatever it is, our justice system is there to get some sort of justice for the person, right? Rather than, you know, be, be, you know, becoming tribal. That that's true. But what I what I've seen, especially with respect to mass torts, is when you go to a conference like the Mass Torts Made Perfect, mm -hmm. the lawyers that are typically attending that conference are lawyers like we were. They they yeah. handle what they now call one off cases or single event cases. Single event, you know, yeah. whatever the heck that means. But. Th those guys are going there to learn the business of mass tort. But in the process, all most of the vendors that are at those conferences are teaching them how to market and how sure. to advertise. And so as a result of this explosion of mass torts has been this secondary impact of lawyers who have learned about advertising in the mass tort world now applying all of that marketing and advertising to these single event sure. cases. And as a result of that, I have concerns that there is too much of that going on, and it's A, depriving well-trained lawyers who a, either A, don't have the budget for it, or see the ethical issues in providing too much advertising on the internet and television. It's depriving those people of the opportunity to practice and to provide their services in maybe a better way than some of these folks who just have endless streams of cash to advertise. And it dilutes the overall representation, and it dilutes the practice of law, at least in my opinion, significantly. I, I agree with that. And, you know, another way of looking at it is this pressure to to market and advertise, and not just by the old school ways of, of being parts of groups and making yourself making yourself known in the community as an expert in a certain field. That's just not working. It's not as effective anymore. So <clears throat> this pressure, if anything, a demand to market online, to use digital marketing methodologies and to do other things that's just one more thing that a practicing attorney has to do that takes them away from the actual practice, the technical aspects of it. And this is just, I think this goes back to something we spoke about on our last episode or the one before that, that there's a, a growing laundry list of things that a lawyer has to do to be successful in, in the profession that, that's in addition to actually the, the work of lawyering. And that's a it's a very difficult thing, and if you on top of all that you're now you're piling on advertising, digital marketing. What what time does that leave you as a lawyer to actually practice? Well, that's it's true, and you know they 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 tell you the experts in marketing say you have to write you know blog posts or have all this content on your website. Mm -hmm. Again, that just removes you from client representation, time in court, preparing for actual legal argument and legal work. And it turns you into nothing more than a marketing company. And again, I'm not trying to like, 
you know, get down on on the idea of lawyers spending money to enhance their practice, to market their practice. That's that's always been done. It's just gotten to the point now where the guys who have the most money and the most budget are the ones who tend to get the most cases. And it's almost become a monopolistic effect where you have a couple of different law firms that have endless budgets that are able to gobble up all the other independent law firms and either they're going to acquire them or hire the lawyers that used to have their own firms to be part of those big conglomerates. Or turn them into a franchise. Yeah, and then and what do you have then? I mean, then what is, I think, been ins- a practice or a, a type of business that's been insulated from that type of yeah. uh, of dilution is, is going to become nothing different than what you've seen by an Amazon or a Microsoft or any other of these big companies that's able to take out all the little vendors and the little guys and just gobble them up and make it into one large organization. Well, I think that's very bad for what, consumers. Yeah, yeah, well, what you're saying is... In in some respects, the legal you know legal services become commoditized, right? And that that opens up a whole Pandora's box of danger as far as this the sanctity of the att- attorney client relation, the quality of legal services. Now I'm not saying that this is going to happen in every instance, but I think it's a uh, it, it what's happening now requires that sort of analysis. Yeah, well, I think thinking back on it when. When practicing was my full time everyday job, all I did was contingency work. You know, it was just personal injury, med mal, and some commercial contingency work, and that was it. Never advertised, never marketed. And so when I was doing that, I was focusing on making sure that the relationships that I had from the people that were sending me that business were solid. And that's because, a form of marketing. Well, it is, but the difference is that if if somebody sent me a case and they knew that I was the one running that case, and I screwed it up and did a bad job, I could lose that referral source altogether, and they'll go somewhere else. So it was important not just, I wasn't just representing the client in that in that case, I was also proving to the person that was sending me the case that it was worth it for them to continue sending me business. If I'm out there just making my living on clicks on Google AdWords or Facebook, it doesn't matter anymore what the representation looks like, because I can keep putting clicks out there on the internet and somebody will eventually come. I mean, sure, somebody could give me a bad review or, or, you know, I could, something could happen negative if I do a poor job, but it is not, it doesn't have the same connection that it used no, you're to occur. Right. It's kind of, you remove that self-policing. Right. And that's, I think that creates a problem. And again, I don't want anyone listening to this to think that, you know, I'm against the idea of lawyer advertising because it's been around forever. My only belief is that it shouldn't be the primary way in which all law firms get their cases. There should still be some limitation on the way that it's done, some internal policing by the bar to make sure that it's not getting totally out of control. And there there, there needs to be that personal connection so that clients know they're getting the best representation from their lawyers. Well, I think also it's a matter of self-preservation for the legal profession. Because when things start to get too commercialized, too commoditized, uh, the lawyers are the ones eventually who suffer. Right. The profession suffers. And I think I mentioned this uh, one of, during one of our other conversations. You, I think that the medical profession is a very good analogy of when things get too commercialized, what can happen to the professionals. Yeah. The it's profession- not good. No, it's not. And you lose a lot of independence, a lot of autonomy, and you go from being a professional offering a, a very specific service to having to do other things that have nothing to do with your profession and nothing to do with your craft. Yeah, Mike, one of my worries is that the day where somebody hires a law firm because of a particular lawyer that they want to represent them will soon be gone because you hire big firm A and the name on the door is not going to be representing you. There's going to be somebody that's part of that huge, really that huge corporation that's going to be your lawyer and is going to be assigned to your case. Whereas Something so personal as a wrongful death or something that bad that's happened to a child or something bad that's happened to a spouse, you want to have that connection to another human being that is going to understand you and is going to represent you. And you want to choose that person. And the people out there, the consumer doesn't realize that when they hire that law firm that they have found and they talk to that first person that they've spoken to, if it's a huge firm that's mainly advertising, they're not necessarily going to get that same level of personal attention that they would if it was that smaller boutique firm. Yeah, perhaps. And I think that that calls into question whether the advertising as the primary form of getting business on these, quote, single event cases is really the best way to go about it. Yeah, I'm not sure. Really, it's a very interesting topic because 
the limitations or the regulations around lawyer advertising, um, the, what were the initial reasons for that? And, and, and are those the same reasons for you know, uh, an increase in regulation now? I don't think so. But what do you think the original reason was? I think it was really um, meant to maintain the perceived integrity of the legal profession. You're talking about regulations? Yeah, initially, just right. ethical restrictions surrounding advertising. I mean, I, I think that there was a time when advertising was completely prohibited. Um, and some states were a little bit more tolerant, others less so on the extent that, uh, to which a lawyer could advertise. I think that that's, that's absolutely relaxed. And, 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 but it makes me think about what were the initial reasons then and what are the reasons now and, and have those reasons shifted? I think that they have. I think, In what way? I think that what, what we're discussing right now is more of a, a concern about maintaining certain guiding principles in the legal profession, about having a, a very tight relationship with your client, about maintaining professional independence. And I think that the more commoditized legal services become, the less, um, the less important those things are to the selection process, to the litigation process, and ultimately what kind of results um, a lawyer is going to be able to get for their client. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And I think that there has been a shift and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that, to, that, that all the professional associations, all the bars in each state have an obligation not just to regulate attorney's conduct. I think that's wrong. It's more, um, we all have an obligation to maintain the integrity of our profession, to make sure that our profession will continue to be uh, an attractive profession for people to go into and for the right reasons. Well, you, you know, that's, it's an excellent point. Even before um, the explosion, really, of the internet spend, which I think happened maybe around 2015, 2014. It's, it was pretty recent. It was while yeah. we were out marketing level. We right. saw this with our own eyes. And so it's not that new of a, I mean, it's not that old of a phenomenon. It's fairly new. Um, but, you know, as as that sort of explosion has occurred, I think there's been less and less regulation over what an attorney advertisement needs to look like. And, you know, I think one of the things that needs to be looked at by maybe the, the folks in different bars and regulating this is is the same should the same principles be attached to a television advertisement or a billboard as it is to an internet ad cuz being a lawyer is serious business it shouldn't be based on some clickbait that gets you to get to a website it needs to be based on something more serious and something much more specific about what that firm can provide and what they have the ability to provide and, and my concern is that if you allow this to go completely unregulated, then you're, you're just going to completely dilute the whole process. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, look, we understand intimately the pressures involved in getting that next case. Because ultimately, you know, one case ends, it doesn't just replace itself. So there's always that ongoing pressure to have a pipeline of cases. But it can become overwhelming. And to what end, right? And if someone becomes an attorney and they recognize that at, to, just to be able to survive, they essentially have to be online marketing experts, it's, it's dangerous for the profession. It is. And I, I mean, I'm, it, I'm curious if they're teaching this stuff in law school. Obviously, I don't know. It's been a while since we've been there. But I have to wonder, are, are they, have they adapted in the educational side to explain to lawyers who are going to be trial lawyers what the dynamic is these days and how it has shifted? I sure hope so. And, and again... One can't talk about this phenomenon without discussing the, the movement towards allowing non-lawyer owners to participate in the ownership of a law firm. And, and I know um, we have a whole episode dedicated to that, but I see these two things as very closely related. They are. And, you know, it's obviously we've talked in depth about the idea of non-lawyers um, owning law firms. And anyone watching here can certainly watch that episode to get some of our thoughts and opinions on that. But it's almost in, in the same vein, if, if a lawyer is not actually practicing, but they're really just running a business and it's an advertising or a marketing business, the mere fact that they hold that degree allows them to stand aside from anybody who's a non-lawyer. But they're really not practicing. They're just out there creating a marketing engine to bring as many cases in as possible. And that's the first place they're going to go. Right. That's the first thing that they're going to look at. All right, like what we're discussing, what are the acquisition costs? What are the channels you're using? What's the efficiency of this channel, that channel? Let's increase our spend here. And that's... That's their way of, again, selling a commodity. Yeah, I hate the I hate the idea of, of of the practice of law being commoditized. But I think it's a unfortunately a very good way to put it.
Now, who, who, who ultimately suffers from that? Well, the clients. The and clients. the attorneys, I think. Well, it depends which attorneys you're talking well, about. Well, sure. <laughs> the smaller lawyers, they, and keep, keep in mind, getting a law degree is a very expensive proposition. So, you know, you come out of law school, you have these grand thoughts about what you're going to do with your career, but then you realize it, it's not exactly what they told oh, you. Oh, man, that's a whole other ball of wax. We were discussing with someone a, a couple hours ago about the cost of getting a law degree and the consequences that that has on people's choices or lack of choices. And yeah, we'll save that for, I guess, a different episode. Yeah, we different. should. But in the meantime, thank you for joining us here on Trials and Tribulations. Hope you enjoy it. And if you have any comments or thoughts, uh, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. This episode was sponsored by Levelask.